Man has three great enemies, sin, sorrow, and death. Those are the three great enemies. Now you think about it. You may think that we have some other enemy. We do not. Sin, sorrow, and death. Now I want to ask you a question. In the light of all of our so-called progress, what has civilization done about sin, sorrow, and death? Where's the answer here? Well, friend, there is no answer apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Profound truth simply stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. Take your Bibles, find Galatians chapter 1, and when you found it, look up here. Now, we fly, many of us, many places. I heard of an airline pilot who came on the intercom and said to the, his passengers, he said, folks, I've got bad news and good news. The bad news is this, we are hopelessly lost. The good news, we're making great time. Now, I think that is very, very much like this generation in which we live. We think that we're making progress, but we don't know where we're going. Now, folks, in the things that really count, listen to me, in the things that really count, we're not making progress through civilization, through science, through learning, through technology. We're not. Man has three great enemies, sin, sorrow, and death. Those are the three great enemies. Now, you think about it. You may think that we have some other enemy. We do not. Sin, sorrow, and death. Where's the answer here? Well, friend, there is no answer apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Put that down big. Put it down plain. Uh, put it down straight. Now, there are those who would want to offer some other panacea, some other answer, but there is no answer. And even the gospel now has been... Uh, the devil has tried to pervert the gospel. Look, if you will, here in Galatians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 6. Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. From that verse, I get the title of my message, The Gospel of Grace. Let me read it again. Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, that is, it just seems like another, but there's some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Underscore that word pervert. But then Paul says in verse 8, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed, let him be anathema, uh, let him actually literally means let him be damned. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it by man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. So, what is the gospel of grace? What is the saving gospel of Jesus Christ? I want to give you five facts here today taken from these six verses, and I want you to see them. First of all, I want you to understand that there is satanic opposition to the gospel. Satan fought it. Satan fought the gospel in Paul's day, and he is fighting the gospel in our day. Look again in uh, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which, but, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, now I'm score this, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Did you know that Satan is a pervert? I say that seriously. Satan has no raw material. All he can do is take what God has created and twist it and pervert it. Satan is a pervert. God made everything, and sin is a perversion of that which is good. Now, Satan, rather than denying the gospel, had rather pervert the gospel because if you will accept a synthetic gospel, then you'll never see your need for the real gospel. So he's not out and out to deny the gospel. He's out to twist the gospel, and he's done a good job. Uh, you know, verses 8 and 9 almost seem unchristian. Look at it. Paul says, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
And again, I want to tell you, Phillips translates that, let him be damned. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, our natural sensibilities, we just recoil at that and say, oh, that's so unkind, that is so bigoted, that is so prejudiced, that is so intolerant. Oh, no. Well, there's room for everything in religion. Folks, if one way is right and only one way, then all the other ways are wrong. That is the gospel that Satan tries to pervert. Now, the first thing I want you to see is there is satanic opposition to the gospel. Satan fought it. He did in that day, he will in this day. Here's the second truth I want you to see. Friend, there is the settled origin of the gospel. God fought it. Now look in verses 11 and 12. Paul is talking about this gospel. Look at it. He says, but I certify you, brethren. I love that word certify. I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the origin of the gospel? God thought it. It came uh, from, from Almighty God. The gospel is not man's invention. It comes by divine revelation. Therefore, when it comes to the gospel, you put your intellect and your emotions to the side and pick up your Bible. Put your intellect to the side. So many times we take uh, the Word of God and parade it past the bar of human reasoning and judgment. You say, well, it doesn't seem right to me that there's only one way to be saved and all other ways are wrong. That just is not logical for me. And so oh, we, we try uh, to bring human ingenuity, human wit and wisdom against the gospel. Now, and then if that doesn't work, well, we just bring our emotions. You say, well, that just doesn't feel right to me. I, I mean, I, I just have a queasy feeling about that. Folks, Again, I want to say it respectfully, it doesn't matter what you think or what you feel, it's what God says that counts. Now, you have to understand that. Now, folks, we have to understand that th there is the divine origin of the Bible, the, the, the settled origin of the Bible. Uh, don't, we're not looking for a new and a modern gospel for a new and a modern age. If it's new, it's not true. If it is new, it is not true. That's what Paul is saying. Look at it here in this passage of Scripture in verse 8. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So we say, so we said before, so say I now again. Paul keeps repeating this. He wants them to understand it. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Uh, what Paul is saying here is this, that if any new revelation ever comes down the trail, it's not of God. If anybody says there's a new gospel, if an angel appears and says, look, I've got, a, I've got a new message from God, Paul says, don't believe it. Now, folks, if an angel were to stand up here on this platform today, I mean a great, glorious, mighty angel, <laughs> just glowing and whatever an angel would look like, and he, he would say, ladies and gentlemen, I have been dispatched from heaven. You folks at Bellevue are the first to know. Uh, we, we've got an amendment to the gospel. We've got some additions to the gospel. We've got some modification to the gospel. Paul says, let him be anathema. I don't care if he's an angel. And then th look at it again. He says in verse 8, though we are an angel, preach from heaven. Suppose Paul were to stand up later on and come to Galatians. And he said, you remember what I said over there when I wrote you that letter? Well, look, I I've gotten a new revelation. I I I have, uh, I've gotten some new insight. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to, I've changed my mind. There's another gospel. Paul said, don't you listen to me. Don't listen to an angel. Friend, it is settled once and for all. Do you have that? You know, every, everybody has the idea that somehow this idea of, of uh, religion is just sort of migrating. It's just, it's just changing and, and that we live in a new day, a new age, and therefore we need a new gospel. What Paul is saying, listen, he is saying it is not the messenger that validates the message. It is the message that validates the messenger. If you're enjoying this message from Adrian Rogers and would like to dig a little deeper into today's topic, download this free companion Bible study. Use the link above to get yours. Now, here's the third thing I want you to see, and that is the sacrificial obtainment of the gospel. Jesus bought it. Jesus bought it. I mean, how, how do we get this gospel? Where did it come from? <laughs> well, Jesus 
bought it. He obtained it with his rich red royal blood. Notice in verse 7, this gospel is not another, this, this false gospel, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert, now watch it, the gospel of Christ. Now, how did Christ buy it? Well, go back to verses 3 and 4. Grace be to you. Remember I called it the gospel of grace? Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the gospel that I'm preaching to you is the gospel that was purchased, obtained with the precious blood of of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of the cross. It is the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a gospel that centers in Christ, not a gospel that simply mentions Christ or alludes to Christ. It is the gospel of Christ. Now, Satan fought it. God fought it. It didn't originate with man. Jesus bought it. And he bought it with his own precious blood. Now, here's, here's the fourth thing I want you to see. I want you to see the saving operation of the gospel. Grace wrought it. Grace wrought it. It is called the gospel of grace. Notice in verse 6, he calls it the gospel of grace. Grace is what causes God to love folks like we are. Vile, worthless, unworthy, sinners by nature, sinners by birth, sinners by choice, and sinners by practice. Thank God for grace. Hallelujah for grace. Why are we saved the grace of God? It is seeking grace. Look in verse 15. The Bible, Paul talked about the grace that sought him. He says, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. He called me by his grace. When, when uh, Paul got saved, he wasn't seeking Jesus, but Jesus was seeking him. Uh, you know, you say, well, today I'm, I'm, I'm just seeking the Lord. Well, friend, the only reason you may be seeking the Lord is because he's first sought you. Don't get the idea that you just thought it up all by yourself. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, there's none that seeketh after God, no, not one. Not one. Uh, well, you say, but, but why then do I have this hunger? Why do I have this thirst for God? Because he gave it to you. Let's think about a natural thirst. We all get thirsty for liquid. God made us that way. Why do we get thirsty? Because God created us where we would have a thirst. Had God not created us with, to have a thirst, we would never get thirsty. I mean, we wouldn't just be walking down the street and say, you know, I better get some liquid. I'm going to dehydrate. No, God made us that way. That thirst that is in us is a gift of God, and that thirst for God that is in you is a gift of God, and it is seeking grace, and it is separating grace, according to this verse here that we're looking at in verse 15. It pleased God to do this. And so the grace that saved you, friend, I want to tell you, is as a God who loves you, and God is seeking for you. When God came into the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned, he said, Adam, where are you? That wasn't the voice of a detective. <laughs> that was the voice of a loving God. God is seeking you today. You may be here today without Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, my friend, God is seeking for you. Thank God for his seeking grace. And that seeking grace, friend, is saving grace. Uh, the Bible, Paul says here in verse 16 that, uh, that God revealed his son in me. Here was old Paul, lost on the road to hell, a hardened Pharisee, and he's saved by the grace of God. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Not, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What is grace? Grace is the free gift of God. You, you're not saved by joining a church. You're not saved by getting baptized. You're not saved by being a Gideon. You're not saved by singing in the choir. You're not saved by preaching a sermon. You're not saved by coming to church. You're saved by the grace of God. By the grace of God, it is saving grace. And that means it's not of works of any kind. That works don't save and works don't help save. Romans eleven six, 6, the Bible says, and if by grace, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if by works, it's no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. <laughs> you can't mix grace and works. If it's by grace, forget your good works. Baptism, whether a spoonful or a tankful, can't take away your sin. 
your prayers, your pilgrimages, anything you do, that cannot take away your sin. This seeking grace is saving grace, and friend, it is securing grace. Do you know why you have eternal security? Because you're saved by grace. Now, if you were saved by works, your works failed, you'd lose your salvation, wouldn't you? Grace can never fail. Uh, uh, down through all of the ages, uh, you're going to just be saved because of the grace of God. And Paul was telling these Galatians this over in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. He said, you foolish Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, are you going to be made perfect in the flesh? Don't you understand that the Spirit that has saved you is the Spirit that's going to perfect you and carry you all the way through? It is securing grace. Now, some people have the idea that they can get saved and lose their salvation after a while. People are so confused about this matter of salvation. Suppose you're out there in the, in the deep briny blue in a, on a cruise ship and you fall overboard and the ship just goes off without you. Let's say you're about 10 miles offshore. Most of us can't swim that far. <laughs> you're out there in the ocean and maybe you don't even know how to swim at all. And up comes a man in a high-powered speedboat and you say, oh, you're just, just trying to keep your head above water. And suppose that man comes along and he says, look, you're drowning let me show you what you do. And so he jumps in the water and begins to do the Australian crawl and the backstroke and the breaststroke and all of that. And he says, you see, this is what you do. Well, friend, that man's not a savior. He would be an example. And you're going blub, blub, blub going under. Or suppose the man stays in the boat and begins to circle around you and tells you what to do. and gives you instructions, takes out a book and reads it on, on, on swimming and safety. And again, you drown. Uh, no, you don't need a, an example. Uh, you don't need an instructor. What you need is a Savior. Suppose he throws you a line and pulls you in and towels you down and puts you in the boat. And you say, oh, I have a Savior. And you start heading toward the shore. And then he looks at you and he says, you know, you're not sitting in this boat just right. And he throws you overboard. <laughs> he, he's not a Savior. He's a probation officer. Friend, Jesus is a Savior. Jesus is a Savior. Oh, thank God for His example. Thank God for His teaching and, and all of that. But He is a Savior. Salvation by grace is such an amazing thing. When people begin to understand it, they want to sing songs like Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It is seeking grace. It is saving grace. It is securing grace. And friend, it is sufficient grace. All you'll ever need. You're not going to run out of the grace of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, the Bible says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound every good work. <laughs> You've got all you need. I can tell you this. I can testify this. I've been on the trail a long time, and God's grace has never been insufficient. Never. <laughs> you think you're going to run out of grace? Is a minnow in the Atlantic Ocean going to run out of water? No, thank God for His sufficient grace. And it is surviving grace. Look, if you will, in verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, the Bible says in the ages to come, we're going to be trophies of God's grace. And when you get up there in the glory, you're going to see Him, and He's going to point to you, and, you're going to, and He's going to say, there it is. Uh, David is there because of my grace. Uh, 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 Jim is there, and Bob is there, Adrian is there. We're all there because of the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When, when he's been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, uh, <laughs> we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. It is surviving grace. Here's the fifth and final thing I want to say about this gospel of grace. Friend, I want you to see the singular obsession with the gospel. Paul taught it. Now, this is very important. Look, if you will, again in verses 9 and 10 of this passage. He says, as we said before, he said it once, so say I now again, he's saying it again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. And not, now notice what Paul says, for do I now persuade men or God? <laughs> do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul was obsessed with the gospel. It was a divine obsession. Now, we all have a desire to please people. We all want to please. Did you know I, I really have a desire to please you? I really do. 
Do you know I like it when you say amen? Do you know I like it when you meet me afterward and say you were a blessing to me? If a preacher says he doesn't, I believe he's not telling the truth. I, you know, I want to please you. I want to please my parents. I like to please my friends. I like to please people. But friend, I'm going to tell you something. I want to be like the Apostle Paul who would say, it doesn't matter whom I please if I displease God. Now, we all have people that we want to please. But you see, if you try to please everybody, you're going to please the devil most of all. Paul loved these Galatians. Paul, uh, Paul talked to them compassionately. But uh, Paul is saying, look, I'm obsessed with the gospel. I, I'm not trying to please you. Now, Paul might have tried to please the civil authorities in Rome. Paul was a Roman citizen. And Galatia was an outpost there. And Paul could have fitted in and not gotten into so much trouble. But you know, Paul knew that it was Jesus, not Caesar, that met him on the road to Damascus. Friend, government, government can't make us good. Only Jesus can make us good. And Paul wasn't trying to please the false teachers. There are false teachers around. And, and, uh, and do you know the way to get along with everybody is just try to never mention true doctrine. Uh, there, there's some people, I'll guarantee you, there's some people right here today say, that, that old narrow-minded, hellfire and brimstone preacher. Paul said, listen, if any man preach any other gospel to you, let him be damned, let him be accursed. You say, unloving. Friend, that was not the way for Paul to get elected clergyman of the year. Paul said, look, I am not trying to win a popularity contest. If you want to be unpopular in today's day that puts a great virtue on tolerance, just preach the old-time religion and say there's one way and only one way to heaven, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't try to please his own family. I, Paul goes on to say in this chapter about how he's a Jew and how he, has, uh, how, how he uh, was raised according to strict laws. You know what they thought about Paul? They thought Paul was a turncoat. They thought Paul had uh, gone south on them, that Paul now had, uh, had, uh, had left them and, and, and uh, they were not pleased with him. And some of you, if you give your heart to Jesus Christ, your family's not going to be pleased with you. Some of you kids, you go to school, you don't tell dirty stories, uh, you don't read those magazines, you don't smoke that whatever it is, you don't pop that whatever it is, you don't sleep around, uh, they're going to look at you like you're strange. You're not strange, friend. You're different. You're different. What was the obsession that Paul had? It was a singular obsession with the gospel. He was a gospel preacher, and he says, I don't care whom it displeases. I'm going to preach the gospel, and you're looking at a man, God help me to mean this, with my dying breath. I'm going to be preaching the old-time gospel of Jesus Christ, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of grace. Satan fought it. God fought it. Jesus bought it. Grace wrought it. Paul taught it. And we're to stand on that old-time gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank God for the gospel. Bow your heads in prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Friend, I am telling you today that if you will receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He will instantaneously, dramatically change you. He will save you. Doesn't mean you're going to sprout wings and get a halo. But He will save you and keep you saved. And that is the gospel truth. If you'd like to be saved, I invite you to pray a prayer like this right now. Forget that anybody else is here and pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that with your precious blood on the cross, you bought my salvation. And thank you, Lord, that I don't have to behave myself into heaven, that I can trust you and that you will save me. And Lord, right now, with all of my heart, like a little child, 
I put my faith, I put my trust in you. I trust you once and for all, now and forever, to save me. And Lord Jesus, begin now to make me the person you want me to be and help me never to be ashamed of you. In your dear name I pray, amen.